The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Then Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The Gospel of the Lord. It was the day before Christmas Eve when all through the church, everyone is still waiting for Christmas to emerge. As one who has been preaching about waiting throughout this entire Advent season, and pretty much every Advent season I've been here, I was the last person to expect that I would be spending a week of this season waiting for a cold and an infection to pass through my system. I was the last person to think that I would still be waiting for this bone-shaking cough to quit. But as I imagine we've all come to find in our lives, waiting never happens the way we expect it to. I mean, have you ever been waiting at a traffic light when the person who is approaching behind you subconsciously decides that they don't want to wait? And right into the back of your car? Anyone? Or maybe you've been like me and gotten tired of waiting and ended up pulling out in front of someone and... You know, it happens. Or maybe as a child, maybe you were the one who was highly skilled at being able to wait until the most opportune moment to have to use the bathroom. Maybe, maybe not. Waiting is just such an interesting concept, isn't it? You know, just recovering from a cold or a virus or the flu, you know that healing simply takes time, and it makes you wait and just be while you're waiting. And I'm guessing you've probably figured out that I'm not good at that. And I know that as I've visited many of you in various forms of recovery from different things, whether at home or in the hospital, we've often made the comment that they call people in those types of conditions patients, for a reason, because you need a lot of them to get through, right? There's a lot of healing that can happen from patiently waiting. And there is a lot of making things worse that can happen by not waiting. So we come back to this question. How has your waiting been this Advent? I would hope that some of you have found that sense of wonder in this waiting. Maybe through sitting, settling in with a warm drink next to a brightly lit tree 
ready to write some Christmas cards to connect with family and friends both near and far. But I also know that this dream of this peaceful waiting during the holidays doesn't often work out that way. There's shopping, there's baking and cleaning and errands. <coughs> and as a friend of mine found out, her, uh, she found herself doing this weekend, there's also plunging out your bathtub. You know, there's always those unexpected occurrences that pop up, like getting sick. Maybe you found yourself without work or a paycheck, as many in our government have suddenly found themselves. Maybe you have been waiting on a diagnosis that still hasn't come. Or maybe it has come and it didn't bring the good news you wanted to hear. Or maybe it's just busy life as usual with the added stress of the holidays. And if I hear Pastor Stephen say one more time that we have to wait, I am going to lose it. You know, there's no time for waiting in these days. But that's why it feels so important for us to deal with and speak about waiting in this life of ours, specifically in this life of faith. I mean, think about this gospel story that we're given here on this fourth Sunday of Advent. For the past few weeks, we've been hearing about John the Baptizer the one who was sent to prepare the way. But now we finally backed up far enough that we can hear where it all begins, with Elizabeth and with Mary. Two women who have been specifically selected by God to literally begin the birthing process of God's kingdom into this world. And in this story, we hear about how both of them spend their time waiting for what is to come. But we also hear from Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, a priest of the temple, a man who a few months before all of this was serving in the temple and was visited by the angel of the Lord, where he was informed that his barren wife, who was up in years, would finally conceive a child. This would be that child who would be filled with the Holy Spirit and equipped to make ready a people to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Who, of course, was John the Baptist. As we know, though, Zechariah couldn't believe what he was hearing, and, and upon questioning this angel, he was struck mute because of this doubt. So this Advent season for Zechariah was spent waiting in silence, which we know that for a preacher would be pretty awful. <laughs> Go ahead and say it, because we never shut up, right? So imagine what this season of preparation, what this time of waiting looked like or felt like for Zechariah as he quietly waited for John to be born. And then we have Elizabeth, who, as we know, for decades was barren and childless, and yet now <coughs> has suddenly found herself pregnant with a child who has been promised to be the preparer of the way. Luke's gospel tells us that for five months she remained in seclusion, waiting for this birth to occur. When she found out she was pregnant, she said, this is what the Lord has done for me, when he looked favorably upon me and took away the disgrace that I have endured among my people. It's in the midst of this seclusion that her relative Mary comes to visit her. And as we heard, as soon as Mary enters the house and speaks, the baby in her womb begins to kick and react. A holy exchange between these two women, a holy encouragement for Elizabeth in the middle of her pregnancy. Imagine then what this sense of waiting felt like for Elizabeth, following the reaction of this miracle child that she is carrying. And then finally we have Mary. And I know we know the story. We hear it every Christmas Eve. The angel Gabriel comes to visit Mary and informs her that she's favored by God and will suddenly be doing God's work by creating and giving birth to the Savior of the world. Not many Christmas pageants, though, include this story. 
this visit where Mary goes to see Elizabeth. So Mary is here spending her time in waiting and preparing using her feet. She travels to see these relatives, Elizabeth and Zechariah. And as we heard, Mary arrives and greets Elizabeth. The child leaps in Elizabeth's womb. And then Elizabeth begins this pronouncement of blessing upon Mary. Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why has this happened to me? What fortune do I have to deserve this visit? Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. There's a great debate about why Mary made this visit, why she traveled to see Elizabeth. Did Mary need the encouragement or confirmation from Elizabeth about what was happening to her or in her? Or maybe Elizabeth needed this encouragement and confirmation from Mary about what was happening to her. Or did these women simply need to be together in relationship with one another, both as outcasts in the society that they were living in, yet coming together to celebrate and give thanks for the promises that God is now fulfilling? This truly is a story that tells us about waiting. And this is a story that shows that God fulfills what God promises. And because of that fulfillment, Mary can do nothing else than to sing and magnify the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord, she said, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. The things these biblical characters do as they wait help to prepare them for what is to come. Which, as we hear in Mary's song, is basically the world being turned on its head. The proud will be scattered and the powerful will be brought down and the rich will be sent away empty, all while the lowly will be lifted up and the hungry filled with good things. Again, God's promise that that those who so often find themselves burdened by the weight of this world, that promise that they will find a new life saved as God's people is finally coming to fruition. And that is also what we are preparing for. And the things that we do while we wait will all help to shape how we are going to react when that day comes and those things begin to happen. Everything we do, not just in those, these four weeks of Advent, but everything each and every day of our lives should always point to the coming of our Lord. But then in those times when we find ourselves struggling to wait or struggling while we wait, we find a good example in Mary and Elizabeth who teach us that we are called to come together like we do here. And be encouraged by one another. And then walk away from here knowing that we indeed have been blessed by what God has done for us. And so, to each of you once again, blessings to you in this season and in this life of waiting.